Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Brain Talks. I'm Deborah Khan, founder of Being Patient. Today we're going to talk about hearing loss and brain health. Uh, if you know anyone who's beginning to experience hearing problems, that may be uh, triggering to cognitive difficulties. So we're going to delve into this topic today with audiologist Natalie Stevenson. She's uh, works in the UK and sees a lot of um, elderly patients or people beginning to experience um, hearing loss. So Natalie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Deborah. Thank you to the audience. So this is a really important topic because it's not only very old people who begin to have hearing loss. And I'm assuming with all of the music and AirPods that we constantly have in our ears, people's hearings um, probably aren't getting better. So tell us a little bit about within your practice, what are you seeing in terms of early stage uh, hearing loss? Who's it impacting? So I think you've hit the nail on the head with regards to um, I think traditionally you would have seen people sort of realizing that their hearing is going, say, um, 50 plus maybe in the like 40 45 50 plus age range but I think there has been a definite shift um, where that's moved away to a slightly younger demographic uh, because of the kind of use of and it's not you know it's not to kind of put down iPods and any other hearing <laughs> um, headphone device that's on the market um, but it is to say that it's the it's the volume of sound and the and the, re the the kind of constancy of it so you know you go to concerts for example and many people don't realize that their artist of choice is actually wearing probably wearing an earplug that's kind of re noise reduction plug and the audience members aren't necessarily doing the same and so um there's that kind of onslaught of sound at too loud a level, which then kind of can cause kind of initially people present with tinnitus because they've sort of been listening to sounds that, you know, music that's too loud. And initially it might just be temporary, but then the more you do it because of the degradation that occurs within the ear pathway, the more you do it, you accccumulate. And so you're seeing a, a, an earlier onset hearing loss as a result. Okay, and just um, to be clear, um, tinnitus is the ringing of the ears, right? Ringing, yeah. So that buzzing, ringing that you, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah. What do we know why that start? Like, why is that a sign that your hearing could be you? You could be losing your hearing because actually, I do know a lot of people who say they have tinnitus. So I don't, you know, I, I'm wondering why is that an early sign. So one of the mechanisms that um, unless that so tinnitus could be attributed to a number of things, there might be um, there might you might have actually. So just to rule those out. So if it's not to do with a heart condition or particular medications, but it is to do with sound, what can happen is that the, you, when you're when you're bombarding your ears, the hair cells in your in, in your in the innermost part of your ear, so the cochlea, it looks like a snail. And basically, it's if you unraveled it it's kind of waiting to hear different sounds of different pitch, crudely speaking. And when you're bombarding the hair cells, they do degrade, they kind of stop dancing. So if I'm talking to patients about what's happening with, with, with your hearing and why you're losing it from a sensory point of view, I would say that the hair cells have stopped dancing, they're not as active. And so what can happen is the mechanism when that happens, you can the the the, the ear the the, whole, the hearing pathway itself can create an internal noise that could be attributed to the fact that there's degradation in the hair cell level. So you're hearing a noise, and then that's kind of it's kind of like when you've got a piece of electrical equipment that's kind of going a bit wrong. You might hear a noise that that and it starts to make a noise that doesn't sound like the system is working as it should. And it can be very subtle, but it can be very kind of, it can present itself say in the evening when you're trying to go to sleep. You're trying to get off to sleep. All the background noise is a lot more subdued. So of course, the the auditory exercise you're getting from hearing throughout the day, because there's different things of sound going on, you're not getting when you're going to bed because hopefully you're in a quiet space. And so it starts to kick in then. What, how do we tell, though, Natalie, the difference between normal aging associated with 
hearing loss? Because I mean, as we age, do we all lose a little bit of our hearing? Is that normal? So, so that can be a normal aspect of how over time, although I do see uh, many anomalies with patients who have got really good hearing, but maybe their eyes aren't so good. And so in terms of like, it's those things in conversation, it's like conversations, for example. So you might be having a conversation and you might be in a busy place and there might be background noise and you might notice that actually you're mishearing or you, you thought you've heard something and they said, no, 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 I didn't say that I said this. And it's that smearing, it's that subtle smearing of particular um, consonants in the words where you'll catch the beginning or you'll catch the end. So you'll get the gist, especially if there's context, it helps, but you might start noticing that in background noise, in kind of the humdrum of the of a, of a, of a day, you're not always picking up as sharply what's being said. Is it though, I mean, are we, you know, kind of like cognitive loss with hearing, is your so, partner the best um, as, person to assess that? Because a lot of times you probably don't notice you're not no, hearing as, well, we, right? as As human beings, as human beings, we don't just practice hearing, we, we cultivate, we cultivate listening. So there's a very fundamental difference between listening and hearing and listening is about processing and attention and, and you, and you wanting to kind of be present to engage in what you're hearing. Whereas hearing is, can, you go to, you have your hearing test, can you hear the sounds? And that's a hearing test. But the other fundamental aspect is the listening aspect. And that brings in processing and, and, and all, and attuning and and readiness and your emotional state as well can impact what you're listening to and you can kind of tune things out so no your partner or your f family member isn't always the best person because <laughs> there's many reasons why you um might not be why kind of about? <laughs> uh, being attentive <laughs> um so okay so um when when is it a concern when how do people know uh, you were just saying that, you know, maybe um, when you're at, at a restaurant and the background gets really noisy and things, words start to to blend together, is that a sign? Okay, time to so, seek professional help. I think, and it's, it's, there's, I think it's much better for people to start really tuning in to and being very, a lot more self-aware and if they are starting to notice those things, there is absolutely no reason that you shouldn't seek to have a proper formal objective assessment of and, and subjective assessment of your hearing because- is it, is it like cognition though, that you need a baseline? Because everyone's- so, so no, so there's a, there's a general kind of, there's a general understanding that within a certain range, you've got satisfactory access to sounds. Um, and we say satisfactory access to sounds in, um, for layman's terms, satisfactory hearing. Uh, again, listening, uh, hearing doesn't mean that you're listening well. So they are two separate things, but there's a, there's a, there's a ballpark. And so it could be that one, if you're having those subtle differences, those very nuanced changes, you may still go and get your hearing tested and you're still in the ballpark for satisfactory, but you might be at the top end. Or it might be that you're creeping past that ballpark and you're coming into that kind of mild loss range and so it's really important to kind of get get a handle on that and you mentioned baseline and that's hugely important around um, people who are starting to experience cognitive issues as well capturing a baseline which okay, is why yeah. when you yeah sorry I don't mean to interrupt you but that's, no. that's kind of where I want to steer the conversation yeah. next how how does hearing impact cognition? What is the direct link? And is there different types of hearing loss that maybe doesn't have such a large impact on cognition? Where's the connection? So fundamentally, when you are when you are hearing, the, the idea of hearing is that you're, it's, ex, it's, it's auditory exercise. It's exercise for your brain. It keeps things ticking over. There are parts, there's a, you know, part of our brain that is waiting to hear sound. We have the auditory nerve that's waiting to hear sound so it can be triggered to send that sound and the signals to the brain so that we can, so that we can hear. And it's that constant stream of activity that the brain loves to have um, to keep it kind of ticking over, if you like. So when you're not hearing so well, you are not 
giving it's like it's like you're under exercising that pathway so you're not giving it the full breadth of what it should be receiving for it to be at optimum and it's not you know it's a huge component it's not the be all and end all but it's a massive component to supporting brain health because of the impact so if you think about the social impact of not hearing well it impacts emotions because when you don't hear well you become more isolated um, you become less engaged so all of that all of those emotional responses that the body goes through when we're not hearing well then feeds into as well how, how our thoughts and our feelings our concentration levels so it all and then when we're weighing down on our brain our brain doesn't like to be weighed down with stress with cortisol with all these things where what the, that stress does it has the opposite effect to supporting the brain health it kind of makes it harder so supporting um cognition with hearing support is i think fundamental um because it it feeds into one's ability to to be in their life to have a quality of life that then you know that, that supports everything else their emotions and all of that stuff can hearing loss trigger dementia or accelerate dementia where's the relationship there so in terms of relationships i think when what we what i've come to understand from the research and the research is is coming thick and fast so there's there's the the idea that if you have gone for a long time without hearing support you're more likely to experience some sort of more rapid or more con or more likely to have cognitive decline at a more rapid rate um because you've been under under stimulated so if you take people that are in sort of a, a setting where care hasn't been provided to the level that they've been maybe sitting that you know they've been in a care home for 20 years and they've not really had hearing support then you one would expect that that would feed into the you know the a dementia or that kind of that kind of journey so it's interesting um, to think about because social isolation is one of the worst things for our brain and if you're losing hearing it makes social engagement a lot harder. So in a way, they're related. Would you oh, agree? 100%. So a, so a babe in utero can hear from 21 weeks gestation. Um, yeah, from can hear from um, 21 weeks gestation. We're, we're pri so we're primed from very from the very start to want to communicate and notwithstanding there are different modes of communication for people that you know have, will utilize as their main language bsl but from a speaking communication a spoken word communication point of view babies need to love to connect they they look at you they look at your face and it and it makes them grow like when you're with, with that nurture with that communication with with being with with being bound now when uh, the flip side to that is when you become older and you don't have those connections as strongly as are needed and then when you can't con when you can't actively participate you can't actively engage because you're not hearing well because you've got other sort of the, the cognitive decline stepping in and if people outside of you are not putting in the work and the effort to stimulate you and to give you a sem uh, to give you afford you that quality okay. of life. Yeah. I'm wondering if you guys can hear me still because something's going on with my video. I think it's probably on my end. Can you hear me? Okay. Hi everyone. We're back. I apologize. Uh, my computer was on the brink and it just froze. I had to reboot manually, but we are back talking to Natalie Stevenson. She's an audiologist from the UK. And we're having a discussion about hearing loss and how it's related to cognition. So I think where I left off, um, Natalie, is to ask you, what should people do if they are experiencing um, hearing loss? You know, if it's a lot of people don't want to wear hearing aids, it's it's a sign that, oh, you're getting older. So what what are the options out there? So I think first and foremost, the one of the ways that I tackle it in a I tackle hearing loss in a holistic way with people because I completely get that people's first reaction 
especially when they're of a younger um, age is I don't want to wear those. They're going to get, make me look a certain way. I'm going to look. To... And the first thing I always say is what's your view on self care? Because fundamentally, if we are about understanding that something's not quite right with us and we're, and we're keen to, to make something better to me, receiving hearing care is an act of self care because it means that you are doing what you need to do to be able to live your life at its fullest like it means that you can engage it means you don't have to avoid it means that you can be productive and 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 participate and and all of that stuff which is fundamentally important to the human experience so i see it as an act of self care i teach self care to even in pediatric uh, in, in pediatrics to little children we, we discuss what does it mean what do those words mean we break it down what do you do that self-care in the morning brushing your teeth so for me it's just it, if it can be formed part of somebody's um, identity in a positive way so that they can actually get through that roadblock and just have the life that you know they were born to have um, without barriers to communication which are hugely detrimental it's important well, even just linking it to um, cognition is really incentive enough, right? So what are the different things that are available to people to address um, hearing loss? We all know like hearing aids are getting, I think a lot better. My dad wears them and they vastly improved when, from when he first started to wear there's, them. There's some super technology, depending on how far you're going to go. There are some slightly smaller models. There's different you know and even now there's different colors so it's not necessarily about it's like this the kind of the resurgence of glasses you know we, we see them they're on us so do we do we want them to blend in or do we make a statement with them so there's all these kind of color options there's the and, and also the tech inside them can do some ex extraordinary things you know you know if you're on the go like taking you, if you you know if you're outside and you you know you're you're busy and then you it, it can adapt automatically you don't have to do anything you just put it on and you go you can have additional programs for more kind of situations which perhaps might be more challenging but we've come so far in the digitization of hearing aids that there are some there's all manner of options and there should be something for everybody regardless of pay point um i know pay point can be an, a huge issue um and you know so there's something for everybody because they're all they're all digital and they're all you know so there's yeah it's exploring I and I I mean I'm really impressed like I took my dad actually to the audiologist not too long ago and and they put something in his ears and the computer actually picks up on his deficits and adjusts the aid to his deficits because everybody has um uh, hearing loss. I want to talk a little bit about nerve damage because I've heard that if you have nerve damage in your ear, that's not repairable. So can you talk to me a little bit about that and how people know they have nerve damage? So with a damaged nerve, that the tendency from from is more likely that you will be, yeah, it, it's it's that's the mechanism in which the sound actually gets gets to the brain and and you then can hear it so if that if that is damaged then that is kind of it renders the hearing kind of yeah it's it, 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 the result isn't great for 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 hearing what about implants i mean there's is it a so, uh, so you 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 need a via for a cochlear implant you need a viable nerve so a cochlear implant is a is is a is a device that is attempting to replicate the hair cells that I spoke about earlier, those hair cells that degrade. So if somebody's, if some, if a, if a child's born with a, with a permanent hearing loss to the level that a co for cochlear implantation, then for, then you're not, the nerve would need to be viable because otherwise the sound doesn't travel up. And what you're replacing within the, within the cochlear implant is you're, you're kind of, you're trying to replicate how those hair cells respond to sound. So, that is that is an that is an that is a option for somebody with a significant hearing loss where the cochlear where where the um, auditory nerve is intact. That would need to that would need to be. So, okay. thank you so much, Natalie Stevenson, for sharing um, uh, this 
a really important, your expertise on this really important topic. I mean, you know, bottom line is if you're experiencing hearing difficulties, go get it checked and figure out how to make your hearing better because in the end, that's very much linked to cognition and socialization, which we know is a very important part of cognition. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you to the audience. And if you want to know more about this, uh, go to beingpatient.com. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletters. That's when we tell you about talks like this one that are very important ar around brain health um, and dementia research uh, and patient perspective. So thanks everyone for joining us and we will see you next time. Take care.